All right. Well, it is good to be back with you for this third uh, uh, iteration of our discussing the uh, the topic of tending the garden. Uh, this is a, uh, a happy uh, coincidence for us today, that today is the day for the blessing of the animals. Uh, I know that when my, uh, my Labrador retriever, Tallulah Rose, um, finds out that she was not blessed, she is going to be disappointed and will demand an extra treat or something like that uh, as a result. She is just about the sweetest dog on the planet and so uh, would be good proof of dogs not having sin natures. Um, so somehow she skipped original sin um, and uh, is, uh, she's, a, she's a sweet, sweet dog. Too sweet for her own good. My parents have a new puppy and that puppy is already higher on the hierarchy uh, than poor Tallulah is. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit ridiculous. Well, uh, when, uh, when we first began this series, uh, the uh, introduction to it was to talk about Paradise Lost. Uh, this is uh, a topic that's so familiar to us, not just from Milton, but it's a pervasive idea that we find uh, all over. Um, if you think about the Romantics, these uh, people like Rousseau and Gauguin and Matisse, uh, what they were in search of to some degree, and you could think of Thoreau, uh, for example, you know, his going into the woods is the same idea that the Romantics had of if we go to Tahiti, we will find a place that is unspoiled by uh, modern civilization. I think it was Rousseau's line that a man is born free and yet is everywhere in chains. And so he thought, oh, if we just go back to Tahiti, we'll be able to find this Edenic paradise. And of course, it didn't work out that way. If you look at, um, uh, there's a, a movie that was, I think it was made during the 90s and uh, had a, a, quite a few different uh, prominent actors who were in it. It was called The Beach. And here, this is uh, Leo DiCaprio. They, they go to Thailand for a spring break kind of moment, and they end up swimming out to this island that's off the coast of Thailand where they, they think that they have found paradise. It's, uh, they, uh, it's not necessarily my vision or a Christian vision of paradise, but it's, it's free love and free drugs and free everything, and, and it's just going to be paradise. But you see this unravel because the, the problem with paradise is that it includes us, and we bring with us our own flaws and foibles, and so there is no true paradise. What's interesting is that you could make a pretty good case that there's no true paradise in the Bible either. That when you look at the Bible's creation accounts, they aren't really exactly accounts of paradise lost. So there are, are three different uh, sort of creation traditions within the Bible. Uh, the, the two that we know the most, obviously, would be Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2. Uh, but there's also a, a large group of poetic texts that describe creation. When you look at these three traditions of creation in the Bible, all three would be versions of creation that don't really quite work in the sense of paradise lost. Now, I'll, I'll start with the one that would seem most like that, and that would be Genesis 2. Genesis 2 is the story of the Garden of Eden and so forth. And uh, the Hebrew word for garden is the word gone. And as I mentioned in our first session together, this is the word that the, uh, when the Jewish community in Alexandria translated the scriptures into Greek, they translated gone there as paradisos. Paradise. And so that's how we connect paradise with Eden. And there are certainly some uh, paradisical elements to the Garden of Eden story. Uh, for one thing, it's a garden. Um, they're not just out in the steppe or something like that. There's the notion of tending the garden, not the toil that will come after the fall. Uh, there's the fact that the couple is there in perfect harmony. They're naked but unashamed. So there are some paradisical elements, but there are also some elements that are not so paradisical. So, for example, if you read the text closely, it says that God plants a garden in Eden. It's not actually the Garden of Eden, if you read the text there. It's the garden that God plants in Eden, and we don't really know what the authors imagined the world outside the garden to be. We, it seems like the garden is an exception in some respects to the world outside of the garden. The tree, so certainly we have the tree of life, but we also have that tree of knowledge, comma, good and evil. In other words, the evil is already present in some sense for there to be this tree that involves the knowledge of it. So it's not that we start off with a world entirely without evil. There is evil seemingly somewhere behind the scenes, and we need no more evidence of this than the serpent. When it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other of the creatures that God had made, well, 
it's this serpent who is this emblem of something that's already awry in creation. And the, the text is, is pretty specific on this, at least in, in the original author's mind. They are not thinking of Satan inhabiting some serpent. In fact, it kind of works contrary to the way the serpent is described in that text. The, the problem that we have when we read the text is, well, how can a snake talk? And that's why it describes the serpent as being more crafty than all of the other creatures there. It would sort of be contrary to say, well, it, it could talk because Satan was inhabiting the serpent. That's a kind of later Christian tradition that will uh, be appended to that. Already, even in this seeming paradise in uh, Genesis chapter 3, we have this creature who has a malicious intent toward that first couple. Creation seems to be an island in the midst of a world that has the potential for hostility, and that serpent is the emblem of that hostility that breaks out. If you look at the other two versions of creation that are in uh, the Bible, they have those same elements of that chaos and uh, sort of latent hostility that's there. I, I, one of the things that I spend the most time on in my study is these poetic versions of creation. So if you were to look, for example, at Psalm 74, listen to this, uh, this set of verses from this psalm. It says, Yet God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the earth, you crushed the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the dragons in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. So here God is fighting against the sea and the dragon. Well, what's the context of this? What emerges from God's having fought the dragon? It says, uh, yours is the day, yours also the night. You established the luminaries and the sun. You have fixed all the bounds of earth. You made summer and winter. This is a creation text. But it's a creation text that's based off of a battle that God fights against the sea and the dragon. Now, when I walk my students through this, we'll go through several passages, and they, they finally, you know, someone will sheepishly raise their hand and say, are, are there dragons? Did I miss that? Where, where, where do these come from? Well, this is actually part of the Bible that is dependent upon a Babylonian creation story. So there's a Babylonian story called the Enuma Elish. It's their main creation story. And in this story, the world begins with water. Uh, Apsu, who is the god of fresh water, and Tiamat, who's the goddess of salt water. And uh, in the, the course of this story, one of the gods, Marduk, has to fight against Tiamat, kill Tiamat, who's both the sea and the dragon, and then create the world from her carcass. So when Psalm 74 does its version of creation, it alludes to that story that's outside the Bible. And, you know, there's a couple of reasons why it does it. Uh, one reason is just speaking in the language of its neighbors. Uh, this is a pretty common thing. If you think about when Elijah fights the prophets of Baal. Baal is the Canaanite god of the thunderstorm. So what is it that Elijah does? He goes in and says, no more rain until I say so. And so he's going after what Baal is thought to be the god of. And even think about the contest that Baal and, uh, and Elijah will have. They go up onto the top of Mount Carmel. It's over near the sea. This is where Baal's palace is. He lives in the clouds on top of the sea. He sends forth his voice, thunder, and his arrows, lightning. And so Elijah conjures up a contest that is meant to be a home game for Baal. They go up on top of a mountain near the clouds, over toward the coast, near the sea. They make the altars, and all Baal has to do is just send one little bolt of lightning, and he wins the contest. But he can't do it. Um, and so that's how this contest works. They're speaking in the language of their neighbors to some degree. And you would probably even say that what they're doing is co-opting the imagery of their neighbor's theologies. To say, if there's any God who's the God of the thunderstorm, it would be our God, not Baal, which is why God lights the altar on fire. Or in this psalm, Psalm 74, to say, if there was anybody who fought against the sea and the dragon and created the world, it would be our God who did this and not Marduk. You find this same imagery in lots of psalms. Uh, psalm 89, listen to this one. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahav. Now, this is not Rahab, the, the woman from Jericho um, who saves the spies. This is a, another name for a dragon here. You crushed Rahav like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you created them. It's a creation text again. 
And what is it that serves as the preface to this act of creation? God fights the sea and God fights the dragon. When you're in the book of Job, listen for the same imagery there. By his power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he struck down Rahav, that dragon again. By his wind, the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. All of these texts, and it's in Job 7, Job 9, Job 26, Isaiah 51, Psalm 89, Psalm 74, and other passages besides this, the way that these texts work is that God enters in as a warrior fighting the sea, fighting the, and the sea is sometimes the dragon, sometimes not. It's this zoomorphism that we find there. And then it's in the aftermath of his having fought the dragon and the sea that he creates the world. In other words, the world begins with this chaotic water, and what God does is fight and defeat that chaotic water, and then once he has, he brings the world into its present state. This is not actually a vision of God or a vision of creation that is paradise at the beginning and then declines. This is one that begins with that chaos, with that hostility built into it. Okay, so what about the most famous of the creation text, Genesis 1. Well, Genesis 1 has that same kind of imagery. The way that Genesis 1 begins uh, in Hebrew, it's Bereshit bara Elohim et et It's in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, and then it begins to describe what the world was like. And the world was unformed and unfilled. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was unformed and unfilled. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Creation in Genesis 1 begins with waters and darkness. When we first enter into the creation week in Genesis 1, it is not a picture in Genesis 1 of creation ex nihilo. God doesn't, in this passage at least, create everything from nothing. The waters and the darkness are already there. Now, now think about the way that that chapter works, and you can see how that, uh, that happens. If you think about Genesis 1, in that chapter, the way that God is portrayed as creating is he speaks. Well, the first words that God speaks are, let there be light. You can search high and low in the passage, and what you'll never see God saying is, let the waters be. Or let the darkness be. In fact, I'll I'll argue in a moment that it would be impossible for an Israelite to conjure up the notion that God could have said, let the sea be or let the darkness be. Because just as the waters were, were chaotic and bad in those Psalms, they're going to be chaotic and bad in Genesis 1. And God is not going to speak this chaos into existence. In Genesis 1, the waters and the darkness are already there. When God creates, the the world is unformed and unfilled, and God is entering into that scene and forming the world and then filling the world. Days 1, 2, and 3 of the creation week are God forming it, putting it into its proper shape, and then days 4, 5, and 6 are him filling the things that he has already formed even when you get to the New Testament, uh, this is the way that they'll describe uh, the creation. Second Peter 3, for example, the, the text says there, the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. The way that creation begins in Genesis 1 is it begins with waters and darkness. But the problem is the water and the darkness are not just natural phenomena. These are elements that are not benign, but malevolent. These are things that are, well, frankly, they're the one part of creation that's not declared to be good. If you read through, and if if you get my book, you'll be able to see this in a much more uh, extended fashion, but the the days in Genesis 1 have an order to them. There's a certain pattern where it will begin, it'll say, you know, and God said, let there be, or, or let the earth bring forth, or, or something like that. So God speaks, and then he does it, and perhaps adds something to it. Um, like, for example, separating the light and the darkness, that kind of thing. And then um, the way the pattern works is that God will look at what he has made, and he will say, and God saw, or the text will say, and God saw that it was good. And then immediately after that line that says, and God saw that it was good, it says, and there was evening and there was morning the first day or the second day or the third and so forth. There are two exceptions to this pattern. 
One exception is on day one. So on day one, it says, uh, this is the, the entirety of day one, reads like this. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Did you notice that the pronouncement of things that are good is moved earlier than where it rightfully belongs at the very end, right before, and, the evening, uh, and there was evening and there was morning. It's moved earlier because God declares only the light to be good, not the darkness. It says, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And then he moves on, separates the light from the day, uh, or the, excuse me, the light from the darkness, and calls the light day and the darkness night. If we were on a different day, it would be at the very end, and God would say, God saw that it was good. But God doesn't look at the night, doesn't look at the darkness and declare it to be good. It's not thought to be good in this text. Day two is even more profound because it is the only day in the entire creation week that has no pronouncement, and God saw that it was good. And the reason that day two, singularly among the six days of creation, is not uh, blessed with this formula and God saw that it was good is because the only thing day two deals with is the waters. In Genesis 1, as in, frankly, the rest of the Bible, the waters and the darkness are not thought to be good. Creation begins with waters and darkness, and these are malevolent forces. This is the reason God doesn't create them in Genesis 1. He's not depicted as creating them, because these are chaotic, evil forces that are opposed to God's will. It's that same kind of language that we find in those Psalms where it says, you divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the water. Psalm 89, you rule the raging of the sea. Job 7, when, when Job is in the midst of his suffering, and he wants to say as one of his arguments to God, God, I am so small. Why are you picking on me? One of his arguments is, this is in Job 7, verse 11. Am I the, uh, verse 12 rather, am I the sea or the dragon that you set a guard over me? In other words, when Job sort of lines up this, this uh, you know, set of cosmic opponents from, from who really God should be concerned with to down to, to you know, uh, small Job on the other end. Now, we would kind of, you know, theologically, you know, imagine that, well, the God's cosmic opponent would be Satan. We'd put him on the other end. That's not who Job puts on the other end. Job says, God, it's, it's the sea and the dragon that need your guard set over them, not, not me. I am so small. Job 9, God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has resisted him and succeeded? Who alone has stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? It's language that depends on Genesis 1. That stretched out the heavens is day 2 and trampled the waves of the sea. I sometimes ask my students, so uh, what, what's your big phobia? What are you afraid of? I, I tell you, I'm worried after this latest round of phobias that we have. I got phobias that I had never heard of before. Um, one, I, this is a brand new one. It's, I have increasing numbers of people who are afraid of small holes. I don't know if you read this, but when they came out with the iPhone, because it had this collection of little lenses and things there, is that certain people were having kind of a visceral reaction against it because there's some kind of phobia out there against small holes. I had one young lady that she can't bear to look at honeycomb because of the lattice of small holes there. <laughs> I don't know what effect COVID is having on us, but it's having something. Um, there was one young lady that squeezy cheese was the thing that she was afraid of. And so, you know, I, I don't know what the next Halloween movie that comes out, but, you know, if Michael Myers brings the Velveeta out towards Jamie Lee Curtis, where we're all in trouble, you know, Jason will he'll have the hockey mask, and instead of a chainsaw, it'll be a package of Velveeta. One young lady was terrified of chip bags. And she was like, well, you know, you reach in there, and, and, and you never know what else might be in there besides the chips. And I thought, Sarah, for the love of heaven, what has your experience with chip bags been? I, yeah, most of them were normal, spiders and heights and things like that. 
two of the things that uh, if you were to ask an ancient Israelite is, well, they would be afraid of the dark. Of course, we're all afraid of the dark. Everybody's afraid of the dark. Uh, the, the joke that I use with my students is you're walking across Sanford's campus in the daytime, something rustles in the bushes, and you think, oh, it's a squirrel. And something rustles in the bushes at night when it's dark, and who knows, it's Jason with Velveeta or a chip bag coming after you, but we're all afraid of things that happen in the dark because we can't see what's going on. If you asked an ancient Israelite, what are they afraid of? The other thing they would say is the sea. The Israelites express a profound fear of the sea. It is evident in so many elements of Israelite culture. You know, when we look at a map, north goes at the top. If you ever see a map that doesn't have the compass rose on it, you know that north's at the top. In fact, if they put the compass rose on it and north is at the top, they're doing it purely for decoration because it is not as if you would be confused and go, I have no idea what to do with this map. It, you know that north goes at the top in our thought. That's not the way the Israelites did it. The Israelites described their directions this way. South is described as right and north is described as left. So, in fact, the, the tribe Benjamin means Benjamin, son of the right hand, because they were southerners. So the right is the south, the north is the left. What direction are you facing when this is the case? You're facing east. They literally turned their backs to the sea and faced toward the east and called the south right, the north left. Israel has the Mediterranean as its border for the length of the country, and it has no navy. Only twice in all of Israelite history, at least in the Bible, do they have a navy. It's this tiny navy that Solomon puts together to go about 40 miles from Israel to Lebanon to get cedar trees and come back. We're not exactly talking about the Phoenicians who could be confused with perhaps having discovered the new world. We're talking about somebody who just dips above the country there. And then there's this other time down at the, the Gulf of Aqaba where they put in all of the ship's founder. And so somebody else offers to help them with their naval stuff. And Israel just says, we're good. <laughs> we, do, we just don't do the sea. Um, and so they decide not to have a navy at that point. Think about Jonah. When Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, Nineveh's up in Assyria, northern uh, Mesopotamia there, and uh, he flees. But you know, Jonah doesn't actually flee from Nineveh. If he were fleeing from Nineveh, he would have gone down to Egypt. That's kind of the way that polarity works. People flee from Mesopotamia to Egypt or from Egypt to Mesopotamia. Jonah goes to the sea. Now remember, Jonah doesn't go to the sea with Israelite uh, shipwrights there. It says that when the storm comes, that they all prayed to their gods. He has to, he has to go with people who are not Israelites when he goes out to sea. And why is it that he's going to sea to begin with? It's because Jonah, a prophet of Israel, thinks that God is not in control of the sea. It says Jonah went, uh, set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with him to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord, Jonah, a prophet of Israel, thinks, if I go out to sea, God can't get me because God is not in control of the sea. Even an Israelite prophet imagines the sea in this fashion, that the sea is something that is opposed to God. The sea is something that is hostile. And of course, the, the, the point of the book of Jonah is for God to say, oh yeah, yeah, watch this. Um, and he tracks him down all, even on the sea. Creation begins with water and darkness, these malevolent forces. The good news is that in this week, God reigns in these forces. God says, let there be light. And then he controls the darkness. He says, let there be a firmament and separates waters from waters. Let the land appear. And he separates waters from land. In Job, it will say, you know, God says to the sea, thus far shall you come and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stopped. Creation begins with water and darkness. But in the creation week, God controls these chaotic forces. And yet, and yet, and yet, when the creation week is done, when God ceases his creative labors on the seventh day, the water and the darkness have been controlled, but they haven't been dispensed with altogether. They lurk in the background like a snake hidden in the brush, 
like a croc that's gliding just below the surface of the water, like a lion that's crouching in the tall grass. The sea and the darkness are those forces of chaos that are always there, waiting at any moment to break out all over again in our lives. One of the things that Genesis 1 is trying to do is to describe a God who is quite different than the gods of the Babylonians. To say to the Babylonians, your God is far too small, But the second thing that Genesis 1 is trying to do is to explain to people like us how we can believe in a God who's in control and yet experience a world that so often feels out of control. This is an image not just of paradise lost, but of that chaos that is always there, ready to break out all over again. In a moment of laughter with our friends, there's a phone call that comes. And we hear that someone dear to us has died. Or we go to the doctor and we get a diagnosis that we did not expect. Or a tornado strikes. Or a car wreck comes. Or we return to that sin that we said we would not do again. Life is going along so well. And then out of nowhere, it hits us like a two by four to the teeth. It's that water and darkness breaking out all over again into our lives. It's the tension of believing in a God who's in control and yet experiencing a world that feels out of control. It is no wonder that the psalmists use the metaphor of water over and over and over again to describe their travails. Psalm 69 says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. This is an experience I think we can relate to. There are those moments when the trouble strikes us with so profound of a a sense of desperation that we feel like someone who's gone under. If you've ever had that experience where you almost drowned, where you were underwater just a little bit too long, and it's an almost instantaneous panic that comes over us because we feel so out of control and we're not sure if we're going to make it back to the surface It's the kind of feeling that we feel in certain moments when we experience distress. We feel like we are drowning, is the image. The psalmists who use this kind of language are tapping into creation theology, wrestling with a God who's in control and a world that feels out of control. You know, I... I have, I have questions. I have all kinds of questions about the, the Bible and this and that. And I, I, there are lots of questions that I just don't wrestle with anymore. I, you know, growing up, I, I grew up uh, incredibly theologically conservative. And so I, I really wrestled with you know, creationism and those kinds of things. And I, I don't worry about that kind of stuff anymore. I just, I, what mainly changed is I don't think the biblical authors are really you know, talking about those kinds of topics. And it was such a relief to find this out because now I, I love science. I mean, science is wonderful and I can both embrace science and embrace, uh, you know, what I think the Bible is saying in its creation text. I, but I still have questions about all kinds of things, and there are issues that I'm just convinced I'll never figure out until I get to heaven uh, that, you know, eventually I, I will see the beatific vision, and I will understand what I don't understand now. But there are questions that, that are more pressing. I think the most important question, the one that gets us the most, is the question, why? Why? And, of course, the trouble is with the question why is that we acknowledge in our uttering it that there's no sufficient answer to the question why. That there are tragedies that we behold that there's no answer we could get back that would be sufficient for us to say, oh, well, in that case, I understand. There are some things... that are just too hard. And so when we cry out why, what we're really crying out is, God, please stop. Or if God hasn't acted, God, please start. God, please act. I find it interesting that when we look at the Bible's creation text, that it does not really seem to delve all the way down into the issue of why. 
it doesn't quite tell us where the bad stuff comes from. If you, you pick your moment and I'll figure out how to go behind it, you can say, well, it's Eden, and I'll say, well, where did the serpent come from? Well, it's here. Well, where did the waters come from? It just does not seem to want to go to the issue of where that stuff comes from. What it is far more concerned with is the issue of now what? What do we do in a world in which those vestiges of creation are still lingering out there? I have two words uh, that I share with my students, and I'll share them with you. They're the words tikkun and tikva. Uh, so tikkun is T-I-Q-Q-U-N, tikkun. Some of you probably heard this within Judaism. There's an expression tikkun olam. And the other word is the word tikva. The word tikkun, it, it's, it's a word that I translate as to heal. What it really honestly means is to repair. It means to repair. It's something that goes beyond healing just a disease to healing the wounds of creation. A, a way that you could put it is, it's our part of continuing to push back the waters and the darkness. There's a very interesting uh, idea in Genesis 1 that as God creates, he eventually, when he creates humanity, he says, uh, you know, now I'm giving you dominion over creation. And what that means is I have begun this creative labor of pushing back the waters and the darkness, and now I'm handing the baton over to you. It is your job to continue this creative labor and push back the chaos. So how in the world do we do that? Well, I'll give you two ideas for how we can tikkun, how we can heal, how, can we, how we can repair. One is by living a moral life. When we live a moral life, when we allow our life to be guided by the principles that Scripture lays out before us, think of the amount of chaos that we push to the side. I'll give just the most practical illustration. I have told my sons, if you get a speeding ticket and you are driving within five miles of the speed limit, I will rise up and call you blessed. I will thank you for driving in such a safe manner. And if you get a ticket... Going faster than five miles above the speed limit, you will pay for everything. You know, I will calculate what the difference is in the auto insurance. I will Every last bit of this you will pay for because if you'll just drive in a sane fashion, think of all of the potential chaos that you banish. You are highly unlikely to get a speeding ticket. Your chances of getting killed in a car wreck plummet if you will just drive in a sane fashion. In other words, if you follow the rules... There are lots of opportunities for chaos that you just push to the side and don't have to deal with. There is happiness that comes for not having to apologize because you didn't say the words that merited an apology. There is happiness that comes from not having to pay off that debt because you never acquired that debt to begin with. There is happiness that comes from not having to call me in the middle of the night and say, I have gotten arrested because I drank one too many beers at my fraternity and now I'm in a world of hurt. There is a lot that we can do to push aside chaos in our lives if we will just live moral lives. Secondly, we continue this work of healing and of creation as we take care of vulnerable people. When we find people who are hurting and we take care of them, we, we create a garden of Eden around them where it's a place of safety and comfort for them when they are hurting. Isn't this the image of the parable of the Good Samaritan? That here is this person who was just walking along to Jericho and suddenly chaos has broken out in their lives. They've been robbed. They've been left for dead. There are those that ignore, but the Samaritan comes, and what he does is he does tikkun. That here he creates this shelter for this person who is hurting, this vulnerable person. He binds his wounds, he puts him into the inn, pays the fare for the inn there. What he's doing is he's creating this little shelter of creation in the midst of a world that is chaotic in his life. We push back the waves of chaos and hurt when we heal other people. When we give to those who are poor, when we bend down to help those who are hurting, when we advocate for those who are oppressed, when we stand alongside a person who's being bullied, we are doing the work of creation when we lead moral lives 
and when we heal vulnerable people. The problem, of course, is that no amount of healing will ever heal everything. And this is where our word tikva comes in. Our word tikva is the word hope. That in a world where we heal what we can, we always know that there will be those things that we just can't heal. A broken heart that can't be mended, a September 11th that we can't foresee, a tornado that we can't put the brakes on. There are always going to be those things that we cannot heal, so what do we do? We hope. If you were to turn to Revelation 21, there is a, a wonderful passage. It says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Well, what is the basis for that happening? It's a, it's a fascinating text, and it's one that I, I have to confess when I was a teenager, I, I was scandalized by. I was in church, and I, some of you, I, you share, you know, the dilemma that I would have had when I was a teenager in church in that, you know, almost unthinkable moment when you might have been bored in church. I realize you have to kind of, you know, uh, suspend disbelief uh, for a moment to imagine such a circumstance. And what I tell my students is the opportunities for entertainment were far smaller when I was a teenager than they have today, there was no such thing as a cell phone back then. My parents would never have let me bring a book other than the Bible to church. There are only so many notes that you can write on the backs of offering envelopes or, or little goblets that you can make from, you know, the foil wrapper on your Wrigley's gum there. Do they even make Wrigley's gum anymore? I don't know. But, you know, the, the opportunities for, uh, you know, entertainment were far smaller back then. So I, I had to do something as the, the, the minister droned on. And so I turned to Revelation 21, and this is the verse that I read. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I thought to myself, that is the worst thing I've ever heard. God is going to get rid of, in the world to come, the best part of the world that we have now. No more beach. Are you kidding? How could, no more Jacques Cousteau documentaries? I, I don't understand. How could God get rid of the sea? I, I betray with that my ignorance of how the Bible actually works, though, because there is no better interpreter of Genesis 1 than the author of Revelation. The author of Revelation understood the sea is God's opponent, it is that remnant of an unfinished creation. As long as the sea is there, creation is not finished. And so how does God finally create, how does God finally recreate the world, a new heaven, a new earth, and the sea was no more, and there was no more sea. The beginning of the next chapter says, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. Isn't it interesting that the world begins in verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1 with water and darkness, and it takes until the last chapters of Revelation before we finally find God getting rid of the sea, getting rid of the darkness. This is when creation is finally finished. I hope you will not miss the link between the beginning of creation and the end of creation in the life of Jesus. What is his life, if not a life of tikkun and tikva, a life of healing and hope? On the one hand, the, the, the metaphor that he uses to be the stamp on his life is that he's a healer. What does he do but go around healing people? Why, why do this? I mean, he could have been, you know, just creating food and solving poverty if that's what he wanted to do. Why is it that he heals it's because he's doing the work of creation. If you're a Tolkien fan, you know that this is why Aragorn, the king, is a healer. It says that, you know, uh, you know Eorid, the, uh, the woman who is the, uh, Eorith, rather, the woman who is the nurse in Minas Tirith, says the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. This is Tolkien making his connection between Aragorn the king in exile, and Christ. And then there are also those moments of hope where Jesus, for example, calms the winds and the waves, saying, this is my down payment on the fact 
that I will one day entirely control the winds and the waves. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, his way of saying the moment will come when I will banish darkness. I think there's an important balance that comes with our having this notion of tikkun and tikva. On the one hand, for tikkun, it provokes us to get busy. If we were to follow Luke's theology, that sort of realized eschatology that says that the kingdom is here in a spiritual sense and it is time to get off our backsides and get to work. Luke is the gospel that says uh, in, I guess to, to quote Hemingway with Robert Jordan, the world is a fine place and worth the fighting for. This would be Luke. Luke who says it is time for us to get busy, to care for the world as we see it. But then there's also that tikva component, that hope component. I think hope is an important check on our utopian ambition. Every utopian vision has within it a strain of totalitarianism. Every vision that we come up with to make the world perfect ends up being a vision of Brave New World or 1984 or you pick your utopia in which it always has to run over some people to make the world the way that it would like for other people. The desire to make the world perfect can lead to overreach, to hurt to those who stand in the way. Tikva reminds us that ultimate redemption ultimately lies in God's ultimate work and not on our own. We long for the day when God will make all things right, and we work now and hope for that day to come. Thank you very much. We have a, a few minutes left. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to entertain them. Sheila's got the mic. Um, are there any questions today? And it's going to be so awkward on the video if I, <laughs> if I go name by name and call out the people who did not ask questions. And, but I'm willing to go there if I have to. So. Uh, did they not have the same fear of the sea then? You, you know, I find it just honestly fascinating. Because So the question was, did these other seafaring people, did they not have the same fear of the sea? Um, when the most uh, you know, uh, important group to compare the Israelite to would, uh, Israelites would be the Phoenicians. They literally border one another. I mean, Phoenicia is just Lebanon. Uh, they're close enough that when Solomon wants cedar trees, that's where he goes to get them. Jesus goes on vacation to Phoenicia one time. That's where he meets the Syrophoenician woman who's up there. And yet, the Phoenicians were just mad about going to sea. They set up little Phoenician trading colonies uh, as far as Carthage and Spain. And, and uh, you know, I, I made the, the comment about uh, people who actually thought that the Phoenicians might have discovered the New World. It's one of those things that they, they didn't discover the New World, but they were so seafaring that it was one that you could kind of, you know, at least consider the possibility. I, I'm not exactly sure what the difference is in their mindset. I wonder if it doesn't have something to do with the way that their, their polytheistic way of thinking about the world might have been different than Israel's monotheistic way. I don't know if that's what it is. I do know that they did have an important uh, sort of myth in their culture where uh, Baal, the god of the storm, fought against Yom, the god of the sea, and they, they viewed it as something that was now uh, over and done with. And Baal was in his palace on top of the sea. And whenever the sea would rise up again, Baal's you know, lightning and thunder would come down on it. And ultimately the sea would calm back down. And yet for some reason, the Israelites, they've borrowed the fear without borrowing the, the navy. Um, and so they use it as a, an incredibly prominent feature of... Uh, as a metaphor for things that they're afraid of. Um, and so you, you find it really all over the place. It's not just Jonah, but all of these different psalms. How many different psalms have this image of waters that are overwhelming us there? And, and certainly it comes up in the Gospels. I mean, uh, the, the whole issue with Jesus, and they're, no, they're not on the Mediterranean anymore, but now in the Sea of Galilee, 
you would think there's never a calm day on the sea, um, you know, to read the Gospels. It seems like every time they're there, they're straining against an adverse wind, or here come the storms that are there. I've been to, <laughs> I've been to Israel, I don't know, 15 times. I was spending six weeks a year there before COVID hit, and I've, I've had one storm uh, the entire time that I was there. So uh, it, they're, they're clearly using this as an image um, and you wouldn't want to say that they're, they're uh, taking it out of proportion, but I think in the same way that we have horror movies where we have certain tropes like cornfields and children and the dark and things like that, I think it just sort of lodged and resonated in a certain kind of way for them. And so it's more, um, it's more metaphor than reality, honestly, uh, I think, in their minds. Um, so. And it's a borrowed image because... For the most part, water is friend in Israel rather than foe. They're longing for the water to come. Uh, it's in these coastal places like Tyre and Sidon or in uh, places where the Tigris and the Euphrates are where they're subject to lots of floods that waters are more dangerous. Israel has, it kind of shows their non-native element. They've brought these elements with them from other cultures up there. But it's a great question. We've got time for one more. Anybody else got a question? Well, I'll leave you with this idea. Um, I, I, I jokingly said this to my students the other day as we were going through the book of Job. Um, and uh, Job is lamenting to God, and he says, I, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish and bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the dragon that you set a guard over me? And I say, see, how does it feel to be among the elect who have been able to take my class and so now you understand that line. And you don't have to be like those others who would come across this and have no idea what this means as you read the scriptures, as you hear the scriptures read, as you, you work through them uh, in services. Be on the lookout for those waters, those darkness, that Leviathan, Rahab, and the dragon that's there. There is a lot that stands behind those texts. They are potent theological texts that are wrestling with creation. And how is it that God is and in cooperation with us and ultimately uh, himself will bring this creation to its conclusion. It's been a delight to be with you all. Thank you all very much.